Awesome. Thanks, Joe. And uh, hello, everybody. Uh, really great to see uh, people coming in really from all over the all over the planet here. Uh, we've got Italy, Mauritius, Germany, Brazil, all across the US, uh, Canada, UK. So very excited to have people calling in from so many different locations. And I think this is going to be a really fun session. So first of all, a quick self-intro. My name is Liam, a CEO and co-founder at Kaitera. Uh, I definitely consider myself an air nerd, so I am extremely passionate about everything indoor air quality for, for reasons that I will explain shortly. Uh, I am also an advisor on the International Wellbuilding Institute's um, air concept, performance concept, uh, and also well faculty, so you'll, you'll hear me talking uh, probably about the, the well-building standard uh, at some point today. <laughs> and as, as Joe mentioned, there is a Q&A tab. So what we will be trying to do is uh, taking some questions that were collected beforehand and then also making sure to answer live questions. So if you do have a question that you didn't think of submitting uh, or you're, you're just um, joining us now, then definitely head to the Q&A tab and be sure to ask your questions there. We'll slot those in throughout. Okay, so uh, Joe talked a little bit about what we do here at Kaitera. I thought it would be useful to also provide a little bit of a, a backstory about why we exist and personally why I care so much about air quality. So in 2014, I um, was in Beijing in China and had the, the uh, somewhat dubious honor of experiencing some of the world's worst air pollution ever. And uh, at the time I was looking for an air purifier to make sure that the air inside my house was was healthy and um, that our family wasn't suffering. Uh, and it, it's actually surprisingly challenging if you've ever looked for an air purifier because they all they all look more or less the same. They all seem to do the same thing, which is whir and make noise and hopefully clean the air. Uh, but it's not necessarily obvious if your air is actually improving. And that was really the catalyst that, that started Kaitera is looking for a solution to measure and understand air quality within the indoor environment. At the time, there were really not many, if any, solutions, uh, really just particle counters that were designed for uh, measurement in, inside a lab or for research, and nothing really for home use or for the workplace. And so that's, that's what got us started. And really throughout this journey, uh, I think, uh, personally, I've had my eyes open so many times year after year, realizing that all these things that are now common knowledge, uh, but we're not before. So for example, opening your windows while running an air purifier doesn't work. Um, sounds, sounds like common knowledge now, but it, it wasn't 10 years ago. And so I think this really opened our eyes to the power of data and when you actually measure how you can make more informed decisions and how many really bad decisions we sometimes make because we don't have the data. So that is, that is what got us started. And uh, again, really excited to get to some of the questions. So we'll jump right into this. And uh, the format that we will try to follow here is two questions that were sourced beforehand, uh, and then we'll take one live question. So we'll, we'll make sure to switch them up. Okay, this is, this is a, great, a great question. <laughs> Hesitant about installing indoor air quality monitors and making the data available to everyone. So we can't control everything, uh, and there are so many potential false alarms that can cause panic. So this is something that I've certainly heard uh, over the years is we'd love to measure IAQ, but we're worried about some of the unintended consequences of that. And I think this the answer to this question, there's really two parts. Uh, the first is that even, unfortunately, even if you're not me measuring your air quality and making it public to the occupants, it already is. Uh, and what I mean by that is if, if you've been on Twitter over the past few years during COVID, you'll see the number of people that walk into a place with a CO2 monitor, a particulate matter monitor, and take a reading and then post it to the internet has grown exponentially. So uh, if you're coming at this from, from the angle of I'm in charge of a workplace, a building, and uh, I don't want to communicate this information, the reality is that somebody in your building probably is already doing this. Um, and the question really then is, do you want to be proactive about sharing this information or do you want to be reactive? And I come very, you know, I have a very strong opinion that it's always better to be proactive about this and say, we are measuring IAQ inside our space. 
if you're interested, come talk to us. We can we can share the data or actually proactively show the data on a screen uh, so that people are aware that that you care that you're doing something, and uh, that also there is you have a say in what type of monitors are installed, and so reliable monitors can be installed because unfortunately what we see is when consumers purchase an air quality monitor off the internet and then they take it into their workplace or their school. Usually they're buying the cheapest thing off of Amazon and there can very often be issues with quality and readings are not reliable. So I think it's a great opportunity actually for people to take charge of the discussion rather than uh, be having to react to somebody that says, you're not doing a good job with your IAQ. So there's actually a really strong opportunity here. The, the other point that I would, I would make on this is, and I think it's a, it's, a great, it's a great comment here that we can't control everything and there can be false alarms. And a lot of this, comes down to data visualization and how data is communicated. What I mean by that is it generally isn't a good idea to show a real-time reading for this very second in a public environment because what happens is somebody walks up to a CO2 monitor, they stand in front of it looking at it going, hmm, interesting, these numbers are going up. And the longer they stand there breathing on the monitor, the more the numbers go up. And that absolutely can give you a, a false alarm or a false, a false positive which could potentially cause panic. But it's not that there's a real problem. It's that somebody is staring at the monitor watching the numbers go up. So again, I think it's important here to look at things like um, hourly averages, maybe to look at what today's air quality looks like overall, not this very second. The data that shows this very second should be used by building facility managers, but, but not for larger communication. Next question, improving IQ and energy, does this only exist in theory? Great question. The answer is no, this does not only exist in theory. In fact, it's, it's, there's a huge opportunity and it's a really important uh, piece of optimizing a building. I think there's, um, we've maybe been taught over the past few years by the policies around COVID-19 that good indoor air quality equals overventilation, just pumping more and more fresh air, and which can, which can consume a lot of energy. But the reality is that those two things are not equal. There are many ways to improve your air quality, and it depends a lot on what the problems are with your air quality. Again, this is why it's important to, to measure and to monitor first. Uh, you may well not have an issue that needs to be resolved by ventilation. It could be that there are particulates in the space and you need some, some other solution, which is much less energy in intensive. So it, it's, it, it's not always true that good IAQ means that you need to consume a lot of energy. At the same time, there is also a huge opportunity and a lot of technology that's being developed to help you identify those opportunities for improving IAQ while simultaneously reducing uh, HVAC energy consumption. And we've seen this to get really directly to, to, to this question, does this only exist in theory? We've seen this and worked on, on projects uh, in real life that have managed to achieve gains in energy consumption uh, based on both improving their IQ and reducing uh, waste with HVAC. And usually that is around identifying parts of the building that are less occupied, um, just control systems that were written that are, are, are not the right ones anymore. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of HVAC that's running at night that shouldn't be. There's a lot of HVAC that's running on the weekends, cooling buildings when there's nobody in them. And uh, there's often a huge disconnect between the, the people that are working on the systems and the people that care about energy efficiency and sustainability. And IAQ monitoring can help to bridge that gap because with the right tools, it's very easy to see that there's energy being wasted. Uh, that's something that we're, we're doing a lot of work on as well. So no, definitely real life applications uh, have worked on them, have seen them, and many people would be maybe disgusted by the amount of energy that is, is being wasted in a lot of buildings, though unfortunately, um, potentially not that surprised by this. Okay, so that's two, two, two uh, questions that were sent in. We'll take one from the, um, uh, fr from the live questions. Uh, okay, so there's a there's a question that's very specific about Kaitera's solutions and working with partners, which maybe we'll we'll answer offline later. Um, and there's a live question here. Let's put this in. 
What is the outlook of growth and adoption of well and or lead building certifications for industrial slash manufacturing facilities? Ooh, uh, you know what? I'm, I said I would answer this. I didn't read the last few words. <laughs> I am probably not the best place person to, to speak about uh, specifically well and lead in industrial manufacturing applications, unfortunately. Uh, I know a lot about both of these in uh, commercial real estate, office buildings, but industrial manufacturing is a little bit out of my field of expertise. So sorry about that. I said I would answer, but I'm, I'm probably going to jump to the next one. <laughs> Yeah, there's a great question here. Do we have regulations for the quality of air in buildings, uh, amenities, and public premises in general? Um, short answer is somewhat there, and it really it's it's very uh, it depends a lot on the geography. So um, in recent years, there have been a lot of, uh, especially in Europe, there has been a lot of regulation, um, particularly around CO2 monitoring. So so five years ago, there were essentially no regulations around IAQ, what is acceptable and whether or not it is monitored. And that's changed in some countries more than other, more than others. Um, Belgium, Netherlands, there's been a, a big push around CO2 monitoring, particularly in uh, public facilities, education. And while other parts of the world, we generally have not seen regulations implemented yet, there is a lot in the works. So there are a lot of bills that are um, being pushed forward that uh, have regulations around CO2, uh, also around energy efficiency, uh, some around particulate matter, uh, but the vast majority today are still optional. So today optional, but definitely the trend that we are seeing is that this is moving towards uh, strict regulation around what is considered acceptable or not. Next question. Indoor air quality standards, what is good and what is poor and how to balance so many parameters? Um, this is a great question. There's indoor air quality, outdoor air quality. Is there any industry consensus? So this is also a topic where it, it varies a lot country by country. And um, some there are some national standards, but mostly I would say we're looking at, at industry standards when it comes to indoor air quality. So to, to, to contrast this, outdoor air quality has, has been very well regulated. There are standards in the majority of countries for, for many years. So for example, in, in the US, the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, sets the um, has created the AQI, Air Quality Index, which is a measure of how good or bad the air quality is. It's a scale from zero to 500. And there are thresholds for what is how many how many days a year at a certain level is acceptable. Similarly, the WHO has air quality guidelines, and the differences between these can be quite large. For example, the WHO's air quality guideline for particulate matter recommends five micrograms per cubic meter, while the EPA says that anything from zero to twelve, so under twelve, is considered good. So that's a, that's a difference of more than two x between these two. Um, Again, that, that is for outdoor air quality. Indoor air quality is, is much more complicated. And uh, typically today, this is in terms of, again, regulation, that's not, it's not dictated by any government, but there are industry standards that have come up such as uh, well. And so typically when we're talking to, and I think this is a good way to approach it. Typically when we are working with, with clients and we will make sure to understand what their goals are uh, around measuring indoor air quality and out of the different industry standards, which one aligns with, with their needs the best. So for example, some, some workplaces say, you know what, we, we want to have the best, the healthiest building in the world. We want to have, we want to follow the strictest guidelines when it comes to health and well-being. Uh, typically we would say, you know, well is a great example of that. While other companies might be looking at balancing uh, indoor air quality with uh, potentially some other concerns that they have, or they're looking at a, a standard which maybe is uh, faster to implement than well. So really it's about working together and understanding what matters to you and what is the right standard that is, is going to work. Um, again, typically my, my, my default would be look at the well building standard. I think that is very, that is very well researched and put together in terms of what is considered good or bad. I, I do believe in the future, we will see industry consensus and also very much driven by government regulation so that there, there are standards for indoor air quality. We've seen a big kind of shift towards that 
um, especially in the U.S. with the, the White House summit around indoor air quality work that the EPA has been doing, it's all generally going in, in that direction. Was that two questions or one? <laughs> I think that was one. Uh, so we'll take a live question after this one. Uh, oh, this is, this is an interesting one. CO2 as an indoor of IAQ, question mark. Does this make sense? And what is the drawback? This is, this is a fascinating question. So over the past few years, we heard a lot about CO2 and a lot about ventilation. This was very much driven by COVID-19 and the idea that we need to have as much fresh air in the building as possible so that we are not essentially breathing the air that somebody else has, has, has exhaled uh, or we're breathing as, as little of that as possible. So that means very low levels of CO2. Uh, this this top this question right here could could turn into an hour long discussion. So uh, I'll try to keep it at a, at, a, at a relatively high level, but it's really interesting. So we often talk about CO two as having a negative impact on uh, cognitive performance. It, when we're in a you're in, in a meeting room with high levels of CO two, you start to feel sleepy. You can't think as quickly. Uh, that is true, but it's a, it is a little bit more nuanced than than that. Um, often what there's a lot of research showing that the factors that actually make us have a negative experience in, indoor, in an indoor space is not so much the CO2, but rather a lot of other chemicals and compounds that exist with CO2 due to human presence and human breathing. So it's often referred to as human bioeffluence. Wonderful <laughs> technical term. So it I, one way to look at this is, is that CO2 is not necessarily what is going to make us feel uncomfortable in a space, but it, it is a very, very good proxy because CO2 is created along with a lot of other things that in their totality make us not feel good in an indoor space. The great thing about CO2 is that it's a, it's, it's a very good proxy because the way that you fix this problem, the way that you reduce these all of these things in the air that make us feel bad is by ventilating more, is by bringing in more fresh air to remove all of this quote unquote, dirty air out of the space. However, these two things are not exactly equal. So what I mean by that is that you could have a space which has very low levels of uh, CO2, but has high levels of volatile organic compounds, VOCs. And again, these two typically, if you, if you, if you graph CO2 and VOCs in an indoor space, you will see that they are usually very, very highly correlated because VOCs are being given off by humans, as is the CO2. Of course, there are exceptions. If you're in a mushroom factory, then CO2 levels will be, will be high, but that's a completely different story. Um, I guess it's a mushroom farm, really, not a mushroom factory. Anyways, um, the two are highly correlated, but you can also have situations where CO2 is not that high, um, but VOCs are very high, in which case you should still be ventilating. So it's important to, and, and you should also be looking at what the root cause of those VOCs are. So again, uh, I know this is a, bit of, a little bit of a long answer, but CO2 is a good indicator of one aspect of overall indoor air quality, but it should never be looked at as the sole metric. And we see this very often. People take a CO2 monitor into a, um, you know, a building, a library, whatever, and they say, the air quality in here is great because it's 600 ppm. But there's a lot of factors that you didn't look at. I can go into a very dirty factory with low levels of CO2 and guaranteed that air is not, is not necessarily good for me. Uh, so use it as one metric, but measure the other ones as well. Okay, let's uh, take another live question. There's a few that have come in here. Um, Question from Shelton here. Would you say that outdoor air quality also affects indoor air quality in a well-ventilated building that has HVAC? Oh, this is a great question. Yes. Um, so absolutely. And I think this is one of the most important things about air, indoor air quality is that indoor air quality is not, and, and the, the factors that impact indoor air quality are not the same all over the world. They're not even the same within the same country. Uh, especially if you're looking at a large geography like across North America. And so to give some extreme examples, you know, I, I'm originally from Switzerland. We don't, there's, there's very, very little particulate matter in Switzerland, uh, especially where, where I live, which is sort of on the top of a mountain. The air is very, very clean. So 
the factors that will impact indoor air quality are very different from somewhere like New Delhi or Beijing, where the most important pollutant in the indoor space is actually coming in from the outside. And again, you see the same thing in, in somewhere like the US where the problems that you're dealing with in New York versus Florida versus um, California when a wildfire is burning are completely different. And so it's not a one size fits all um, sort of application. And I think we need to be really, really careful about that because you see a lot of people that just follow uh, guidelines without really thinking about the, the, the nuances of the, of the location. So I've talked to so many buildings that, you know, building owners or managers that will say, we are, when you ask, what is your indoor air quality strategy? The answer is we follow ASHRAE or ASHRAE plus 30%. Uh, and then, or just, we ventilate as much as we can. But you go to, the, to, the, to this question, it, it, does you know outdoor air quality affect indoor air quality? Yeah, absolutely. If you're based in in uh, if you're based in California and there is a wildfire burning, uh, your biggest concern indoors is is what is going on outdoors. Even with great HVAC, with multiple you know, levels of filtration, a high high level of um, a high rating of of MERV or HEPA filter, you are still going to get, probably get a significant number of um, pollutants uh, in terms of PM. PM 2.5 coming in through the HVAC system into the building. And the decisions that you make around how, how you how you run the HVAC system are, are also really, really important. So you might want to, for example, bring in less outdoor air and recirculate indoor air a little bit more because by recirculating it, you get to pass it through the filters multiple times, which is going to reduce the, the particulate matter. So getting a little bit into the weeds here, uh, but... In a nutshell, yes, you need to look at what, what is outside the building, what is inside the building, what are the mechanical systems, if any. And at the end of the day, the best solution is, is monitor, get data, understand what is actually happening, and then you can make data-driven decisions based upon that. How important is ventilation to providing good indoor air quality? And is ventilation overrated? Yeah, um, so again, this is, a, this is a very interesting one. Ventilation is very important. Having the right ventilation is, is even more important. As I was saying, not every, not every part of the world needs the same solution. In fact, it's, it's vitally important that you don't use the same solution. What is going to work in New Delhi is not going to work in New York and definitely vice versa. Um, so ventilation is, is key because it is essentially the only way to reduce CO2 levels inside a space and to reduce volatile organic compounds, TVOC. Uh, now, of course, there are things that you can do to prevent the generation of these. You can, you can by choosing the right building materials and a few other things, you can generate less uh, chemicals inside the space. But ultimately, even just humans being inside a space are going to generate VOCs and those need to be removed. So absolutely, ventilation is important. What what I would say is I think it's a really good question underneath. Is ventilation overrated? Well, sometimes, yes, because it isn't it isn't the be all and end all of of good indoor air quality. Uh, you might have great c o two but have terrible problems with particulate matter, in which case, stop thinking about the ventilation and think about how you can uh, remove those particulates, maybe through portable air purifiers or or some other solution. Uh, the The downside of ventilation is, of course, the impact on our planet. Um, it's ventilation uses a huge amount of energy. Uh, almost half of energy consumption within the average building is used on HVAC and buildings, uh, the operation of buildings account for about 28% of all energy consumption in the world. So that is a huge amount of energy that goes to just moving air around our buildings. If, if we can reduce it while maintaining good indoor air quality, that, that, is, that is really, really beneficial to uh, the planet and of course to the wallet of <laughs> whoever is operating this building because it's expensive. Um, How to best optimize indoor air quality in buildings with different occupancy and usage patterns. This is interesting. And occupancy is very, very important in, in a building. And when we're thinking about indoor air quality, I think it's vital to also think about occupancy. So the most simple example is we want to have low levels of CO2. We want to have low levels of particulate matter in a building. But if nobody's in that building, do we really care? And the answer should be no, because... It, what we care about is the health and well-being of the people within the space, not the space itself. And so it's it's really important to keep in mind 
when spaces are occupied, that is what we should care about. And when they are not occupied, we, we shouldn't care about them. And another way to look at that is actually, and, and this is one of the things that we often look at, and we have reports for this in, in, in software, to look at what is the air quality of unoccupied spaces? Because if the air quality of an unoccupied space is too good, that probably means that you are wasting some energy. You're probably overventilating. Maybe there are air purifiers that are removing particulates. So in an ideal world, and this is maybe a little bit idealistic, but what you would want is that your occupied spaces have great air quality and your unoccupied spaces have poor air quality, because that means that you're really maximizing um, sort of on those two axes for energy efficiency and also optimal IAQ. Uh, I think one, one thing worth mentioning here is that you can get a lot of information and understanding about the occupancy patterns of a building from the indoor air quality data. So from looking at IAQ data, we can see also how, how our space is occupied, what do those occupancy patterns look like, and then matching that with the IAQ, start to see is there any, any um, opportunity for, for optimization. And I would say that, again, there's a huge opportunity here for energy savings. We've seen multiple multiple buildings where you will see uh, potentially 30, 25, 30% of energy going towards HVAC that could be saved by simply changing the the control systems by, as in the, 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 the settings uh, when it comes to the controls of the building, or by working on a lot of sometimes really low-hanging fruit. Okay, we will take a live question here. I see there's a few technical ones right here about our product. So again, we'll we'll probably try to answer those offline so that this can be kept as much as educational IAQ session as possible rather than a um, specifically Kytera product uh, session. But thank you very much for the questions. Sorry, there's a lot of questions here. Just trying to <laughs> make sure we get one that is most relevant to everybody here. Um, yeah, so um, see one here um, is more of a maybe a market question and I guess industry than a technical question. Oh, sorry, let me hit the answer live now button. Uh, are there certain market segments or industries that you see more interest in IAQ monitoring from? And on the public side, are there any government agencies or NGOs that are focusing on this work? Yeah. Um, So I think there are, there's probably two large categories that, that we typically see. Uh, one of them is companies, so private companies. These are typically Fortune 500s, for example, where their focus is, they have a really strong focus on um, improving the occupant and employee experience. And so these would be companies that typically would be going for a well certification for their buildings. Maybe they're going for lead certification and uh, they put a lot of focus on the, the employee experience. Those often turn, tend to be tech companies. So the, the big tech companies, um, uh, financial institutions. Uh, so we see a lot of traction in, in these areas. Another one, another completely different group would be uh, public. And definitely we see a lot of attention in sort of the K to 12 space, which I think is, is great and absolutely should be uh, an area that is regulated and this should be mandatory in because like that's the future of, of any nation. Um, children spend so much time in an indoor environment and often they are relatively small rooms that can have 30 people inside them uh, breathing. And it is, and, and the only thing that's being done in there is, is using your brain, right? Is learning. So it's really important in a space like this that the space is optimal for learning, which is the, the desired outcome. And so we do see a lot of, um, you know, in Europe, some regulation in, in other parts of the world, funding available for this and, um, so there, there's definitely a, a, a huge opportunity there, and it's something that really should be should be uh, more widely implemented. And we are seeing a lot of traction. There's a lot of large projects going on across different states uh, to implement monitoring and ultimately solutions uh, in in that sort of in the K to twelve space. 
Okay, uh, we've got one here. Myths around IAQ monitor coverage area. What is the right coverage area? What's the right density? So this is, this is, this is always a, an interesting one. We, we get this question a lot. We hear this all the time, which is I'm looking at air quality monitor A, I'm looking at air quality monitor B, and this one says it's suitable for 3,000 square feet. And this one says it's suitable for 5,000 square feet. So I'm just gonna bust some myths here. All indoor air quality monitors, regardless what technology is being used, are monitoring the air at the exact location of the monitor, right? They're pulling air into a monitor, they're taking readings, and then the air goes out the other side. So the idea that a monitor can cover a certain number of square feet or square meters is, is just sort of fundamentally flawed. Uh, what the IAQ monitor does, just like a thermometer, is measuring the air at that specific location. The question here is really, okay, so what, how uniform is a space, right? Because if I'm taking a temperature measurement, uh, maybe within one room, it's, it's going to be somewhat similar. But if, if it's an enormous room and there's a, there's a, a heater on one side and there, there is a window open on the other, then the, the, the two temperatures on each side of the room are going to be different. It's, it's the same thing with IAQ. If you have three very small conference rooms side by side, they might each not have many square, square feet or square meters, but they're going to have completely different uh, levels of IAQ. And so you would want to measure each of those separately. And the reason for that is because this conference room might be empty. The one next to it might have 10 people and the one next to it might have one person. So they're all going to be completely different. I think the question is really when you look at large uh, open office spaces, maybe you have um, a few thousand square feet of, of open office space. In, in that situation, it's uh, a little bit harder to say. As a general rule of thumb, I tend to Again, follow the, the well guidelines for this, which is around 30, 35, 100 square feet, around 300 square meters um, per monitor in an open space. But typically we will, uh, yeah, at Kaitera will do a lot of work with, with customers to understand looking at the floor plans together and saying, what, what are the goals? What are you trying to achieve here? What's the budget? What is the right amount of coverage for this specific floor plan? because that's that's the best way to to find the the balance between having high granularity of data and not overspending on air quality monitors that won't give you any more useful information. But again, all monitors have the same sort of coverage area. They they're all doing the exact same thing. They're measuring what goes into that monitor and nothing else. Oh, this is a good one. How to get companies to actually walk the walk about ESG as it relates to indoor air quality. Uh, so their annual reports say one thing, but it, when, when it comes to purchasing, they say something else. Okay, so this is, this is a, an interesting question. We've definitely seen a trend over the past few years of, well, a ESG reporting in general being a, a much larger part of um, what companies are doing. And also the, the impact of indoor air quality and I'd say building, buildings in general and the, the health of buildings or, or the impact of buildings on people's health being a large part of the conversation as well. Uh, so maybe actually I'd start off by, I think, pointing to and, and just giving props to the companies that, that are doing this. I know, for example, uh, both Uber and I think Goldman Sachs and a few other companies in their, in their annual reports now have a section on, on ESG. And, and within that, they have talked about the work that they are doing on their buildings to improve indoor air quality and ultimately improve the health of uh, their employees and the occupants in those spaces. So that is great. And I'm really excited to see that that trend is going and is, is, is growing and you know, going in very much the right direction. That is a great thing. That said, I think this is a great point that annual reports might say one thing, but actual uh, decisions and purchasing and uh, work being done in buildings might tell a different story. And I think, you know, really here, the, the, the way that I look at this is um, ask for specifics, be specific. It, it is, it is, you know, if you look at the example of also sort of within, within tied to ESG, if you look at something like diversity, companies are publishing those numbers. They will say, you know, this is our percentage, the different percentages, um, here is you know what this used to look like this is what it looks like today we have increased diversity um and we should be doing the same thing when it comes to our our buildings and indoor air quality 
there is with monitoring absolutely the opportunity to say, this is what our buildings used to look like, but we care and about this. We prioritize this. And uh, here we've seen a 30% improvement in indoor air quality. Uh, we have seen 25% reduction in uh, sick days being taken, for example. Uh, so there, there are definitely metrics that can be extracted from this that I think are, are really valuable. We'll prove that these companies are investing and are seeing the results that they want to see from this. And you know it should it should be uh, it should be expected in, in the same way that uh, you wouldn't you you wouldn't be okay with an annual report that says uh, we care about diversity. You say okay, well what are you doing about it? How many people have you hired? How diverse is the team? Give me numbers. Uh, it shouldn't be okay to say we care about our occupants. Full stop. Um, and you also wouldn't be okay with with someone saying we hired some diverse people, <laughs> right? You, it, it, so there's, there's definitely an opportunity to, to, be, to get into the data and be much clearer about what exactly is being done. Okay, I think that was a couple of questions. Maybe we'll take one live and Joe uh, can let me know how we're doing for, for, for time here as well. <laughs> I think we've got time for a few more questions. Okay, perfect. So there's a uh, question here that is a little bit specific to Kaitera, but I think it's uh, it's it's there's a statistic in it here which was uh, you know I've never seen this before and that's really interesting so I think it's it's definitely worth sharing with with everybody. Um, it's from uh, Dr. Sean Chang, uh, and the question is 28% of school cafeteria workers in Korea suffer from lung diseases. Uh, that that is a crazy number. Can Kaitera handle the extreme levels of air pollutants in kitchens of school cafeterias? That I mean, so first of all, that's that's a really unfortunate statistic, um, but I think is important for everybody to to be aware of. When we talk about, and maybe I'll share a couple of statistics tied to this. So, the WHO estimates that there is about seven million premature deaths every year tied to air pollution. Now, when we think of air pollution, we often think of smokestacks and something that is maybe far away and removed from us. But the reality is that about 92% of the world's population is breathing unhealthy levels of air. Most of us are unfortunately experiencing some form of pollution. And out of those, those 7 million premature deaths, approximately half come from indoor air pollution. And so a huge source of indoor air pollution is, is exactly that. It is uh, cooking, it's the lack of ventilation within kitchen spaces, uh, even really good ventilation in kitchen spaces often is not enough to reduce pollutants to an acceptable level. So to get to the question, the, 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 the part of the question here, you know, can, can, can our sensors handle the extreme levels of air pollution that are in kitchens? Uh, yes, and the, the, reason, the reason I say that is because at Kaitero, we've developed this modular design where sensors can be replaced within this, the main device. So instead of replacing the entire, entire device, you can simply replace the sensor. So if you're in a very, very polluted environment, you can replace the sensors more often. Uh, and again, not trying to sort of take this and turn it into a sales pitch because that's that's not why we're all here. But um, I think it is really important when thinking about indoor air quality monitors to make sure that there is a strategy for keeping the device accurate over the long term. Because mm -hmm. fundamentally, these are devices that are measuring particles and dust and dirty things in the air. And they will, by definition, be exposed to those pollutants, and they will become dirty and potentially drift over time and provide not accurate measurements uh, or just stop working. So it's really it's really important to have a strategy in place that can deal with that. And um, for us, that's a modular design. If you're looking at any other sort of IAQ monitor, I would just make sure to, to really think about what is the strategy for making sure that these devices can last in potentially very dirty environments for many, many years. Because the last thing that you want is that your your device that is giving you supposed to give you accurate data is outputting nonsense or garbage. Oh, this is a big one. How to accurately model and quantify the complex interactions between outdoor and indoor air pollutant sources, characteristics, human factors, regional climates, in order to predict and assess in real time the sorry, that part of my slides covered up. 
the combined impact on indoor air quality and develop effective mitigation strategies. Wow, thank you to whoever submitted this. This is a very uh, thorough and probably quite technical question. <laughs> um, yeah, this is this is definitely a tricky one, and I would say that there there is no simple answer, and it's and it's this is the million dollar question. I think my answer to this question would probably be, it is complicated. We haven't. This is this is the reason that our company exists. The problem that we are solving is is exactly this one, <laughs> uh, because it is fundamentally extremely difficult to model and to quantify all of these complex interactions. It's not something that somebody can just sit down, look at the data in their building and realistically be able to come up with a, a, a good strategy to, to address or, or come up with the best strategy to address. It requires a lot of experience in an expertise in air quality, indoor air quality, understanding uh, the, the physics and the chemistry of what goes on inside a building, outside a building and how these two things interact with each other. Uh, it also requires the ability to process sometimes really, really large amounts of data. So just to give uh, everybody kind of an example, we we did a a um, a project with a, a customer recently, a big tech company uh, in California. And uh, in this initial pilot, there were about a thousand IAQ monitors spread across five buildings. And those five buildings generated 8 million data points every single day. So just think about what that looks like, 8 million data points every single day. Trying to process that and make sense of that is, is just a huge, you, I mean, it needs a large amount of processing power. It needs a lot of expertise. And the react, the, the, there, there's a lot of complexity between these. It's not, it's not as simple as with temperature or humidity, where if you say, right now I feel hot, I'm going to turn the thermostat down, reduce the temperature, and I will feel better. Um, if you feel too too cold in a building, then maybe you're going to, to reduce the amount of air that's being delivered into the room from, from the HVAC system. But that is going to lead to an increase in CO2 or potentially an increase in VOCs. Now, how do I balance those, those two things? Uh, if the air quality outside is polluted, depending on the filter, the, sort of the level of filtration that exists in the mechanical systems, then again, because I maybe feel too cold and I turn the HVAC down, then I might be getting more or less pollution being, you know, landing into the room from from inside, uh, either through the mechanical systems or even through the windows. So, and again, what if I open the window? Then we have a whole a whole new sort of variable that's thrown into this this very messy equation. So, it it, it is very very complex. All of these things interact with each other. I think often the solutions can be quite simple. We've seen sometimes very simple solutions that have that are that are really low hanging fruit um, and and very high ROI. Where I might just um, maybe there are changes to to the uh, day to day operations of the building. Nothing complex. No need to replace replace the air handling unit or anything like that. But getting to that simple solution from eight million data points a day can be very complex. Um, and so again. I, you know, my suggestion to this question is to work work with people that um, spend their time every single day doing only this, uh, be it Kaitara or or anybody else that has uh, this expertise. Cool. So just looking at the time, Liam, uh, looks like we have uh, time for one more question. I know we're slightly over time. Uh, if anyone does have to drop off, we certainly understand. But if not, stick around. Uh, we'll get to this last question. Perfect. Uh, and thanks for that, Joe. All right. So we'll take this one very quickly. Um, what are some trends and challenges in the IQ field? So this is a little bit, I, th I think my answer to this would be would tie a little bit to the last question. One of the big trends that we see is that people are actually measuring their data now. People actually have data now. Five years ago, the question that I would hear the most is, how do I measure my indoor air quality? The question that I hear the most now is, I am measuring indoor air quality, but I don't know what to do with the data. Help me. <laughs> How do I make sense of this information? Because it is a lot of raw information and the relationships are complicated. Um, so that's very much where, where we're focused as a company. We see that as a big pain point, And we're working a lot on making sure that people can make sense of their data. 
uh, I think overall it's a, it's, it's, it's a huge trend within, within buildings. We're measuring more, but there's, there's, there's what comes after measurement. One of the other uh, trends, which is also a challenge, uh, it's, it, it's a great thing that there are now so many options for measuring indoor air quality. There's, there, are, there are more options for hardware, uh, depending on what you want to measure, what sort of connectivity you're looking for, there are more and more options available. One of the challenges is that there is, tied to this, is that it can be hard to know the reliability of a device. There are a lot of options that have appeared on the consumer market. And I can go onto Amazon and buy something that may or may not do the job at a relatively low price. And um, that can sometimes muddy the waters going to, I think, one of the first questions. Uh, people will walk into your building and start taking measurements. But unfortunately, sometimes the tool that is being used to take those measurements is not necessarily the most reliable. Um, there's a lot more information online if anyone's curious, happy to talk about it some more. But there's there are certain certifications and standards that exist for the reliability and the accuracy of monitors. And uh, I think, you know, this this is it's, it's a challenge and this is something I'd encourage everybody, if you are looking at IAQ monitors, putting these inside your buildings, make sure to see what standards they meet and uh, just to make sure that you're actually getting data that you can rely on. There are a lot of questions here that we didn't get to today. So uh, just a note that definitely happy to follow up later with people. I think we're going to do some more of these sessions in the future. So um, if we didn't get to your question today, I'm sorry about that, but uh, we can continue the discussion either next time or get, reach out to you uh, offline. Uh, with that, I think I'll hand it back to, back to you, Joe. Fantastic. Um, so we are going to skip the live Q&A. <laughs> Sorry, everyone, uh, for that little teaser there. But uh, uh, thanks, Liam, for spending the time with us today uh, and sharing your knowledge. And hopefully everyone came away with a deeper understanding uh, of indoor air quality. And hopefully you got your question answered. If not, like Liam said, we hope to do more of these sessions in the future. Um, and for those uh, of you who have stuck around till the end here, just want to highlight a few upcoming live events that we that may be of interest to you. Uh, so we'll be running a few uh, public product demos in the next few months, uh, the first of which will be next week. So this is a great opportunity to join and see our IAQ hardware and software solutions in action. Also to get answers to any of those more Kytera specific questions that you had. Um, further along at the end of May, we'll be joining, we'll be joined by the team from WiredScore. Uh, so we'll be taking a deep dive into the WiredScore and SmartScore certification, uh, what that is and how that works. Uh, and uh, finally, we'll be on the road in June at RealCom 2023 in Las Vegas, Nevada. So if you're there, feel free to drop by our booth, uh, number 1029, uh, to meet our team there and learn more about Kytera and our solutions in person. Um, so I want to thank Liam again and also everyone on the call for joining today's session. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and that we see you again in our next webinar. Yeah, Thanks, thank everyone. you everyone for participating.